So once we know that the atom makes up all the matter that we have, there's interest to figure out if the atom itself can be broken down to smaller particles. And this was the experiment that eventually led to the discovery of things like protons, electrons, and neutrons, which are all smaller than the atom. Now to understand the discoveries that I'm going to talk about, you have to first understand one of the most important interaction in our universe and really the, the most important interaction in chemistry, which is called the electrostatic interactions. So what the electrostatic interaction is just the interaction that you learn in elementary school to be like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And this was discovered actually a long time ago. People realized that if you rub amber, which is a type of material with fur or you rub glass with silk that the object after it's being rubbed can start attracting other objects. So an example is shown here with a comb that's been rubbed by fur. You can see that the comb can now attract pieces of paper. And so that tells you that there is some type of attraction between the comb and the paper. Now you can see that happen in a lot of other examples, static electricity, if your hair starts to stand in dry weather. All of those are examples of electrostatic interaction. It was explained later on that all objects display a property called an electric charge. An electric charge can be either positive or negative. And then what people learn is positive and negative charges attract each other. So this is symbolized by these two attraction right here. And then positive and positive and negative and negative repel each other. There's an equation that we'll learn later called Coulomb's law that allows us to calculate the strength of this attraction and repulsion. I'm going to emphasize this right now because this interaction is the interaction that determines all the things that happen in chemistry, whether it's chemical reaction or formation of the atom or formation of molecules, compounds, and so on. Let's talk a little bit about how the other subatomic particles are discovered. So the first subatomic particle to be discovered was the electron. This was discovered uh, by a person named J.J. Thomson, and he was studying something called a cathode ray at the time. So a cathode ray was this little green light light. It's a type of radiation or light that's emitted when you connect this tube to an electrical source. And the ray always comes out from one side of the tube that is called the cathode. And that's why this ray is called the cathode ray. The ray will go from the cathode towards the other side, which is called the anode. People don't know what this ray is made out of, but what he noticed is that if you were to put a magnet on the ray, the ray can be bent bent. So it's no longer straight like earlier, but now it's bending downwards. If you put the magnet down here, it's going to bend upwards. That can be reproduced if you put electrical charges as well. So if you put a negative charge, that ray is also going to be bent away. Uh, if you put a positive charge, the ray is going to bend upwards. Because the ray is bent away from negative charges, Thomson concluded, because of this electrostatic idea, that the ray itself must contain negatively charged particle because negative and negative repel. Thomson also found that the ray shows up not just with one type of material, but with all kinds of material. That means this ray must be a fundamental component of all material. So in other words, it's not just specific to oxygen, for example, or specific to iron or specific to aluminum, but it's present in all types of elements. So then that make him think that this is something smaller than an atom that exists in all types of atoms. Further experiment where he's bending the ray, he could make a measurement of the ratio of the mass of the particle that makes up the ray to its electrical charge charge. And that ratio, which is given the symbol m over e, where m is mass and e is the electrical charge, is this number right here. Negative 5.68 times 10 to the minus 9 grams per coulomb. Now this number is not as important as you'll see in a second. Later on, this cathode rays is called electrons, um, and now it stands for the negatively charged particles that we find in atoms. And that name was first proposed by Stoney. Now Millikan was the, actually the person who then figured out what the actual charge and because you have the mass over charge ratio, if you know the charge, you can also figure out the mass. So the way he did his experiment is as follows. And this is very well known experiments called the oil drop experiment. 
experiment. He had a oil a container here, and then this thing is something called a vaporizer, which just makes the oil comes out as mist uh, of fine droplets. And this is the actual instrument that Millikan used. The oil droplet is going to fall because of gravity. He had set up this chamber in such a way where there's two electric plates here. The top one is positive and the bottom one is negatively charged. And at the time he was doing this experiment, x-rays were already known. But the other thing that x-rays were known to do is that x-rays can ionize things, meaning that it can make electron jump from uh, air to something else. So as these droplets are falling down, due to gravity, he shine his x-rays. And what happens when the x-rays are shine is that the electrons in air is going to jump onto the droplet itself. Once the electrons jump to the droplet, now the droplets are negatively charged. At that point, he turns on the electric plates because this plate is negatively charged. The negatively charged droplets is now repelled by this plate. Now, you can adjust the electric field here in such a way that the droplets droplet is exactly balanced midway between gravity pulling it down and repulsion by the electrostatic charge right here. And by doing that with a number of these droplets, he was able to figure out exactly what the charge on the electron is. And that number is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. Coulomb is a unit of charge. The negative here is to indicate that an uh, electron is a negatively charged particle. Now, once you have this number, which is your E, your charge, you can combine that with the mass to charge ratio to calculate the mass of the electron, which is a very tiny number. It's 9.1 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. Or sometimes you'll see this written as negative 31, but the unit would be kilogram. So once Millikan found this, then Thomson, you know, tried to figure out, well, how is the the atom made up. We know that electrons exist because all these experiments supported that idea. But then they also know that in our universe, matter is electrically neutral. So we can't just have the atoms composed of electrons. There must be some other positively charged species that balance out the electrons. And so Thomson proposed this plum pudding model, which is shown right here. And what this is, is just that the electrons are there, like in a chocolate chip cookie, uh, dotted all around. And this yellow cookie dough here represents a sphere of positive charge that balances out all the electrons. Now, once Thompson proposed the plum pudding model, a person who was working with him at the time, which is Rutherford, decided to test it out. He wanted to know if this model is really correct or not. And he said that the way he can test it out is he can take a really heavy particle, which is called the alpha particle in this case, and he's going to shoot it on the surface of the atom. Now, because the alpha particle is much heavier, what you would expect to happen is if you were to shoot something that looks like this, where there is, you know, everywhere is pretty much the same and the electrons is really light, then that alpha particle is just zoom past through the atom. Okay. And in fact, he was thinking that that's what's going to happen. And he said that it's like shooting bullets at a piece of paper. Basically, it's, it's just going to pass through with no problem. So the experiment that was set up looks like this. This is called the gold foil experiment. So he has a gold foil. And the reason he uses a foil because he wants that to be as thin as possible. So it's just one layer of atoms. And this is the source of the alpha particle. And this ring right here is a detector. It detects the alpha particle. And the goal, of course, is that he wants to know where the alpha particle comes out. And uh, the expectation is that the alpha particle should be here at the back, okay? Because everything is just going to pass through. So these two pictures here is just showing the look from the top of the instrument that Rutherford was using, right? And here's the gold foil, here's the source of the alpha particle, and then here's the detector, okay? Now, what's interesting is he did notice that all, almost all the particles went through, okay? So that was matching expectation, but the the thing that's interesting is that not all of them do. So there's a small percentage of the alpha particle, as you can see in this drawing, that actually get reflected back. So you shoot it like this, and then it shoots back here. Now, it's not a lot. It's actually very little. And in, in, in fact, it's about one out of every 20,000 of these alpha particles that have that behavior. But there's enough of them to be interesting. If you think about it, there must be something that's really hard that's able to block the alpha particle in the atom, right? And so that's what led Rutherford to propose something called the nuclear atom model. The nuclear atom model looks like this. 
It's basically an atom is composed of electrons that's kind of moving around a nucleus where the nucleus is where all those positive charges are concentrated in because earlier in the plum pudding model the positive charges is kind of spread around and mixed in with the electron here the positive charges is all concentrated in that core that's called the nucleus later on Rutherford himself discovered these positively charged particles and he called them protons and a student who was working with him at the time, James Chadwick, discovered that there was another set of particles that are packed in with the proton in the nucleus of the atom, and that's called the neutron. So this table here summarizes the properties of all these three fundamental subatomic particles, right? Proton, neutron, and electron. So the electron, as we just said earlier, has a negative charge. The value of the charge is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. The proton has exactly the same charge, but with the opposite sign, so a positive charge. The neutron has no charge, so it's zero. Now, a lot of times people don't want to use these numbers because that's kind of hard to remember, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So instead, we just say the charge on the electron is minus one, and the charge of the proton is exactly plus one, balances out, okay? The opposite of the electron. Now again, these are just kind of reference values that we use, right, to make things a little easier to remember. So if I have something that has a plus 10 charge, then I know it has 10 protons in it. If something has a negative five charge, then it has five electrons in it. This makes it a little easier to understand how many protons and electrons are around. What about the masses of these subatomic particles? Well, we already know the mass of the electron. It's very tiny, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 28. The masses of both the neutrons and protons can also be measured pretty much using the same technique that we use to measure the mass of the electron. And the masses turns out to be quite a bit heavier compared to the electron. So it's 1.67 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. If you calculate the ratio of the mass of a proton to electron, it's approximately 7,000 times heavier, one proton to the electron. So to make life again a little bit easier to remember these numbers, instead of using grams as our unit, a new unit was developed, which is called the atomic mass unit, or sometimes has the symbol U or AMU, and we just let that mass of 1.67 times 10 to the minus 24 equals about 1 AMU. The neutron has very similar mass to the proton, so the mass is also 1 AMU. The electron is much lighter, so you can see that in AMU unit, the mass of the electron is very small.